Thank you, Kwame, for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to talk about notes from a young Black chef. Welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> You know, it's funny, I I kept going back and forth. I have both the grown-up version and the younger readers version. <laughs> and so I would like read part of it and then I would go back to the adult version. And <laughs> it's so funny to get um, so the sort of, I don't know, down and dirty, um, you know, vocabulary the sec for the other one. Anyway, it was, it was really funny. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like, it's like the kids bop version. Exactly. I have two teenagers. I have four kids, but my I was reading it out loud to, to my older kids. And um, anyway, they loved it. So I was trying to get them roped in. But <laughs> anyway, um, well, congratulations on this memoir, which was really, really amazing. Um, I don't know when you found time to also write this book after and remember everything as clearly as you as you did. Um, for listeners who aren't as familiar with you, would you mind telling a little bit about what made you write this memoir to begin with? Um, obviously, it was such an inspiring story, but just what made you turn it into a book and take the time to even do that? Well, you know, I, I think everyone has a story, most importantly. And uh, you, you got to put yourself out there and believe in yourself. And writing this book, I knew that it would impact people in different ways, you know, understanding a different perspective of yours, feeling validated um, from, from, you know, uh, feelings of, of oppression in different ways, um, giving a snapshot into life, was, uh, what it's like to, to come up in fine dining uh, or catering, just in the food industry in general, from a younger perspective. Uh, you know, I think chefs are changing. You know, we're multifaceted now. We're not, we're not stuck in a box. So it's given me the opportunity to write books like this, to open up, you know, nail polish companies and, and media companies and things like that. And I think it's special. And but most importantly, I think everyone has a story to tell. And that's what this book uh, is really, really about. Well, I love like in the book how during one of your first big events, you tried to get everybody's attention and you stood up on a chair and you're like, I'm the one cooking your meal. Like, come on over here. Come here. Um, I feel like that's what you're doing with this book. You're just like, okay, take, let, let's have a little time together. Um, this is important. Listen up. <laughs> I just love that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I remember that day so clearly and it really... <laughs> The funny part is it, it's because I needed more time to plate up my dishes for the first course. <laughs> this long story and, and I saw how engaged people were. And that's when I knew I, I think I had something special. Wow. Um, you write a lot about your ability to kind of go back and forth into different worlds, right? And your ability sometimes to appear you know very guarded and just like keep your emotions your head down your emotions in check and then at other times you know just that you can adapt to basically any circumstance you even had a quote you said my ability to slide through these two different worlds was my greatest assets in the in those years um tell me a little bit about that and how your sort of ident ability to fit in everywhere and yet keep your most private stuff in check has helped you out in your career yeah, you know, I think um, definitely being a chameleon has helped me in my lifetime. Uh, I really think that you shouldn't ever change who you are, but you should be open to other people's perspectives. And that's the way that I was able to switch to different worlds, whether I was, um, you know, in, in the South Bronx or I was in, you know, the Upper East Side. It was really about not thinking that my perspective was the only perspective like really listening and, and getting in tune with other people. And uh, that, that's really what, what made me, you know, as successful as I am. Well, it, it certainly, um, it certainly can help uh, with everything. And I mean, you were so open in the book about your relationship with your dad. And I think that when you are in a relationship that, requires you to sort of feel like you're auditioning for someone who's supposed to love you. It gives you that extra sensory skill to adapt and everything. Can you tell me, just talk a little bit more about your relationship with your dad and the sort of the abuse that you had to deal with, um, you know, even down to not, you know, after he gave you the Jeep in the, in the middle of the book and in the middle of the book, in the middle of your life, um, 
and how you got that Jeep and everything. And then like when you got arrested crazily that one night, which was ridiculous, how he wouldn't even like get the Jeep back. And I mean, I know that's like the, just the end of the whole thing, but, um, and not such a big example compared to the things you referenced. But anyway, tell me a little about that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's something that I've kind of like grown to kind of like forgive from afar um, because there's no book on parenting. Um, you know, and also thinking about the black experience in the eighties um, of, of feeling free for the first time and also dealing with, you know, the um, injection of drugs into our communities, you know, from people that are supposed to be helping us like the CIA and stuff like that. It's hard to even for me to like be upset anymore. <laughs> Um, it doesn't make me forget, forgive to the point where I want to have a relationship, but it's, it's now that I have a lot of a greater knowledge of, 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 you know, what the mental capacity was of someone of color in that time frame, just doing their best. Um, you know, it's, it's part of being a human being, um, and, and, and having some empathy with that. Now, the, the abuse that came from that. I think it, it molded me into the person that I am today. Um, there's definitely a lot of negative things that are still with me about the trauma, uh, but it was something that directly correlated to my craft and my industry. Because you know, when you're in the kitchen, you have to be very focused and meticulous. You can't make any mistakes. And I wasn't allowed to make any mistakes when I was a little kid. So it just transferred over to that. And it's not a good thing, but it is a byproduct of that abuse. Well, I'm really sorry. Um that that happened to you and you know the chart on the wall i mean the whole thing i'm just so sorry not that you need to hear this from me but um just as one of your bazillion readers um it broke my heart to have to read that what you went through as a child so anyway i really appreciate that i really do honestly um, uh so <laughs> you got your start essentially, you know, with your mom's catering business and then on the ship. And by the way, that scene, um, you told it in such a visual way. I feel like I watched the movie of this whole thing sort of playing out and how you, in every instance, you just take the situation and you're like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm just going to do it. I'll figure it out once I get there. And then you do, <laughs> and you like rise to the occasion. Um, do you feel like you're, that's just like a gift sort of, that's just like innate part of your personality. Do you think that's something that can be taught? No, it can be taught, but it has to become a habit first. Like you have to like really practice it. I'm very free spirited. I live my life off the wall. I go where the wind blows. So for me, it's like, I'm myself, no matter what, you know, I walk into, you know, Jay-Z's house and, and still just be my silly self or I walk into my grandma's house and still be my silly self. And I think when, when, when you're just unapologetically you, you can roll with the punches because you know, it's not going to last, you know, a painful moment is, is, is a moment that doesn't, it's not a painful eternity. So when you really think about it like that, even feelings, you know, when I'm sad, I'm like, this feeling is going to pass. I'm going to see something that's going to make me laugh you know, in the next four hours, no matter how sad I am. So when you think about that, then you start anticipating and looking for this, the rainbow and looking for those sunny days and then turning those rainy days into sunny days or then just appreciating those rainy days because you've been through sunny days. So um, I, I think it's, it's something that, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I guess it's a gift, you know, that I'm able to just like, it is what it is, shit, let's drink. I don't know, you know, so like just have a good time all the time instead of, um, you know, really uh, getting in your head and internalizing things. But it's not that serious. Like, however serious you think it is, no one is thinking it's that serious. And if anybody, you know, if you're ever ha having a bad time or a bad day and, you know, someone is sees that and jumps on that, kind of kicks you when you're down, I just negate those people from my life or what they were trying to do because nobody that actually cares about me would kick me while I'm down. They would pick me up. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that you have to work on. You have to work on positivity and positive thinking every single day. I feel like part of the narrative in the book was almost like the narrow escape, right? All the odds stacked against you at the beginning. Um, not that you didn't have, amazing influences like your trip to Nigeria and you know your grandfather and like you know obviously you're super bright and all the rest but like 
there were so many times in the book when you were deep into drug dealing or the moment where you turned your life around that day in the apartment and whatever, um, where you just didn't have to, like, you could have just not done that, obviously. Uh, but you did. And you, you know, so many other people did not, were were not able to, as you know, turn difficult circumstances into how you have created your whole personality and your career and all the contributions and everything. Uh, what does it feel like to, to have been that one? Do you feel like there's like, not that you're the only one, but do you feel like there's a responsibility to like, go back and help others? And I don't know. Yeah, there's definitely a responsibility because like my, my story is unique to me. Um, I was able to get out of situations and turn my life around and build my life up. And I don't think everyone has those opportunities, you know, so I do realize that there's a, um, a bit of probably just privilege, but privilege in, in the sense of my tenacity that I keep going no matter what. And I know everyone is not wired that way. There are people with mental health issues. There are people that have, that don't have the mental, uh, you know, dexterity to even push through those moments because they've been beaten down so much. You know, they've gone through worse child abuse than I have. So like, I'm never going to sit up here holier than now, but I do think it's my obligation to then reach back and help out people. And I think it all starts with mentorship. You know, uh, it starts with, with access to information. It starts with uh, access to, to, um, to different cultures. And I think um, with that, we can make the world a better place. Very true. Um, now that you're, now that the book is out in the world, have you, do people, do you find that people look at you in a different way now that they know, or do you feel like anything that you revealed has changed relationships in your life? No, nothing's changed relationships. I would say it's definitely strange people walk up and say like, hey, how's Jewel? I'm like, how do you know my mom's name? I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, um, or they talk about the school that I went to or something. It's very surreal um, in, in that regard. But no relationships have, have changed. If anything, they've gotten stronger. Um, you know, me being able to tell my truth and, and my perspective of, of how, you know, my life went. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all exciting. It's exciting that it's being turned into a movie. You know, that's gonna be another wave when people get to see it visually. Yeah, um, tell, tell me the details of that. Yeah. What, what can you say? <laughs> A24 is producing it, you know, the company behind Moonlight and Uncut Gems and, and other other um, movies of that caliber. And Lakeith Stanfield is playing me in the movie, which is pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I don't think it's really going to hit me until I'm sitting down eating popcorn, watching someone portray me, you know, on a, on a giant screen. I think that, and try to look like me and stuff. I think that's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, gosh. If you thought this was surreal, that's going to be crazy. <laughs> I have to say, I, I first heard about your book from another chef. So I feel like that's like the highest uh, accolade. Um, uh, my husband's cousin is Robbie Felice, who owns this restaurant called Viaggio. And he was just like, this is the greatest story ever. And, what, and I was reading it and I was like, oh, this is going to be a great movie. This is amazing. So um, I don't know. To have another chef sort of love it is. That's a stamp. That's a stamp yeah. we need. <laughs> um how do you feel about having to do like publicity interviews do you hate it do you like what do you think oh i like it i like it i mean at first it was very tough and uh i was very stiff you know but i think now i'm a bit more relaxed and more comfortable in my skin um you know that's come over come with time it's come from failing and not giving a crap anymore you know i think i think i failed in in, in failed in the sense of the word that other people use i don't look at it as a failure but it's like I had something that did not work out to the way that I wanted it to, but it taught me so much. But with that happening, it was like, screw it. I'm gonna just be myself because you're gonna hate me regardless for something that I have no control over. So you might as well hate me because I'm being me unapologetically. And now the interviews and all of it is just like, it's like I'm talking to a friend. Awesome. Well, tell me about the nail polish. What's that about? I like wearing nail polish. Um, you know, I started because I have my nieces, I get my nieces every summer. And one time I took them to the salon and they were like, if I can get my nails done with them. And I came out and I loved them so much. Um, so yeah, I started this nail polish line um, that'll be sold everywhere soon. And um, 
yeah, pretty exciting. And what about more fashion stuff? Uh, I loved your sort of, I feel like the book should have been sponsored by Prada or something uh, like that. Maybe you could do some cross marketing, kind of get it for sale at the checkout. <laughs> yeah, you know, I love fashion so much. Um, I think it's also an expression, just like I like nails. It's, it's an expression of who you are. And you're able to really, you know, put on a costume for a day. And, um, excuse me. You're able to put on a costume for a day and go out into the world and be representative of how you want to look. And I think it's fun. Clothes are really fun. Clothes are really intricate. I think they 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 carry so they carry a story just like a dish, just like a song, just like a film. Um, and uh, it's something that's always been prevalent in my life. I've always, uh, you know, invested a lot in the way that I look. Awesome. Well, you've got great glasses. Those are really. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Like from the fifties. No, they're very cool. Um, I was struck in the book when you, you had. It was a point in your life where you were really struggling for money, and you said you had gone about three years without with your glasses being crooked um, because you hadn't even stopped to fix them. And you know, now here you are with these like gorgeous glasses. And uh, <laughs> those rainy days will make you appreciate the sunny ones. So yeah. Um. Another thing was how you realized with the cooking, and I think this goes for anybody, even just the most you know basic home cook, um, that the best part was showing how much you care through your food and creating that sense of home. And almost, you know, my husband cooks a lot and he's always like, you know, you can taste the love, you can taste it. It's different if I make this dish, if you have it in a restaurant, because I'm doing it with all of me. Um, Tell me about how you use that in your, in your life and, and uh, how that's informed your sense of cooking for, for everybody. Yeah, well, you know, I think when a dish tells a story, it, it has a soul. You're not just cooking for perfect seasoning. You're cooking to share something with someone, some nostalgia, a story, an experience. And I think, you know, you do have to cook with love and you can taste the difference. When, when you're cooking for someone um, that you really care about, you're going to make sure every thing is perfect with that. And, uh, you know, I think you can really get to know someone on a plate. You can get to know someone's culture on a plate. It's, uh, it, it's one of the only art forms you ingest. You know, food is so poetic in that way that you can, you can even see who has been within a region based off of the food that is served. You know, if, you know, there were, you know, some sort of Asian community in, in, a, in, in an area, if there was, you know, a uh, European community in an era based on the ingredients that are there. You can always trace back ingredients to a certain place. So I think food is beautiful. It always should tell a story. You should always put your soul into it. And if you don't, if you wouldn't serve it to the person that you love the most, don't, don't put the dish up. That's normally what I tell my cooks in the restaurant. I loved your idea when you had the seven course meal of basically telling your life story through the courses. Yeah. I, I was thinking to myself, I was like, how would I even tell my life story through the course? Like, what would, like you've had such an interesting story. And I'm like, I don't know. I live like five blocks from where I grew up. This would be so boring. I would be, it would be like cinnamon toaster. I don't even know. It's like the same stuff I've been having my whole hey, life. Hey, you do a, a bacon, egg and cheese course and a cinnamon toast crunch course. And yeah. a coffee. <laughs> do it. I got faith in you. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so what do you eat like on a normal basis? Like what do you have for breakfast today? I didn't eat breakfast today. My mom is making chitlins and I am saving my appetite to eat a big bowl of it. She is in town right now. Aww. Her dishes and no one eats it anymore because they think it's disgusting. And I'm just like more for me. So um, I can't wait until it's ready. I can't wait. You spoke, you wrote about your mom and with such respect, by the way, I feel like as a mom, I would only hope my kids would write about it. I feel like everything you ignore, you see her in like every way and you saw her, her struggles and you saw her gifts and you, just all of it. She was like a full on multidimensional person. And I feel like some people only have the sliver of their parents that they can see in relation to themselves. And that was totally not the case here. Yeah, no, I mean, she's been my mentor for the past like 10 years, solid, solid, strong, like, any question I have, I go to her. <clears throat> you know, I didn't really have mentors in the food world. So it was like, it was more like she was trying to guide me through my life based off of like what she would have done differently. I remember even 10 years ago, this is when I first knew I could 
ask her a, a question and she wouldn't treat me like her son. She'd treat me like her. So like, it was when the iPhone first came out, the first, very first iPhone, it had to be like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And I saved up for it. I, I had like a thousand dollars. I don't know how I saved that up, but I did. I was like 18 years old and I was like, Ma, I really want this phone. She was like, how much is it? I was like, I think it's like a thousand dollars all in. She's like, that's that's when phones weren't a thousand dollars, you know, phones at the most for two hundred dollars. That was an expensive phone, like a razor phone or something. But she's like, that's a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a phone. I was like, I get it, but I have it. She was like, that's irresponsible. I was like, okay, think of it this way. If you were my age and you had no bills, no children, uh, I, I had a job and I had a thousand dollars saved up. You had a thousand dollars saved up and you really, really wanted it. Would you get it? She was like, absolutely. Like, of course I would get it. Now that you put it that way, of course I would get it. And at that moment, I was like, I can actually come to her for advice. And she wouldn't treat me like, if I call my grandma and ask her if I should buy a phone, she'd be like, are you kidding? You know how many meals I can cook with a thousand dollars and how much this is that and the third. And it's like, well, I'm not in your shoes. So like, think about me and my shoes, please. I need advice from an elder. And my mom, she navigated me throughout the world. I really give her a lot of credit for the past 10 years of my life. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Love that. Um, so you have your regular ag adult book. You have the younger readers book. Are you going to make a children's book, like a picture book? For I really want to, actually. I really want to make a children's book, like a picture book. Um, you know, I want to do a children's cookbook. I want to do an animated series, like a children's animated series. So, yeah, I have a lot of, lot of ideas in this, in this crazy head that I want to put out into the world. Awesome. And is there anything that you're actively like focused on now? So you, all these other things have to wait. Like what's taking up most of your time? Most of my time is this event called the Family Reunion that I'm doing um, with Food and Wine Magazine at Salamander Resort and Spa in Virginia. And it's a, a food conference that's celebrating uh, all the contributions of uh, black and brown people to the food industry that, that so many times go unnoticed. So uh, you know, I have like 47 people coming out and doing panel discussions and breakout sessions and demonstrations and events. And it's a lot of coordination. I was telling my culinary director, I was like, this is like, the only thing harder than this has been opening a restaurant. <laughs> There's so many moving parts. Um, but it's taken up a lot of my time, but it's a lot of fun. I, I, I want it to be inaugural. So like once we get it right this first year, next year would be a little bit easier. That's awesome. I'm doing something on a much smaller scale, but I'm doing a retreat um, in November with like 40 participating authors and all sorts of panels and all of this stuff and rooms and assignments. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and I made the mistake of getting involved with like who the rooms and that next thing you know, like everyone's like, okay, well, you know, for the meals, like I keep kosher. Is there, you know, I, I have like celiac, like, da, 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 like every, I was like, okay, hold on. Like there's so many of you and I can't keep this all straight. Like, hold on, I'm doing other things. So yeah. 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 It's a lot. It's a lot. I get it. Planning, event planning is, it's, it's a nightmare. I'm just going to say it. It's a nightmare. <laughs> I, I, there's, I mean, but you know, it's going to be great in the end. So it's oh, worth it. It's amazing in the end. It's yeah. just getting, getting to that finish line. Um, that's, that's the most important part. So do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Write it down, make it happen. That's it. Just start writing. Uh, take it one day at a time. You know, um, if you want to write a memoir, I would write out the coolest points of your life or most interesting points of your life and then try to bridge them together uh, harmoniously. Um, but it's a, it's a process. It took me two years to write this book. And um, it was, it, that's, the, that's probably in, in order of hard, it's restaurant is the hardest, then event, then book. So it's right up there with like the hardest things you're gonna do in your life. There's so many editing. I mean, I've read the book probably like 37 times, you know, so it's like, um, and then it's cathartic, you know, you're really, re you're reliving these moments that you try to like hide away and, you know, not talk about ever again. Um, or you're reliving moments where you, you can celebrate and realize that you, you, you did have an interesting life or you, you have come a long way. So I would just, you know, just start it. It's the only thing you can do is start. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I hope you go enjoy your, your mom's great meal. <laughs> yeah, I will. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.